Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Diplomacy After Hours. My name is Jane Carpenter Rock, and I am the Acting Director of the National Museum of American Diplomacy. The mission of our museum is to share stories about the history, practice, and challenges of American diplomacy in order to better explain the value of diplomacy to the public. Tonight is a very special night as we are celebrating 60 years of the State Department Operations Center, a little known but incredibly important institution that has been on the front lines of history. Our program will share the history of the Operations Center and explore the important work it does on behalf of the American people. You will also hear from both current and former Operations Center staff who will describe how the work they have done has advanced diplomacy. The Operations Center, or OPS as we call it, is very near and dear to my heart as I also worked there early in my career. I will always have a deep appreciation for what I learned in OPS and the people I met there. Someone else who has a deep appreciation for the works of the Operations Center is Secretary of State Tony Blinken. And tonight we are honored to have a recorded message from him on the occasion of Ops 60th birthday. Happy 60th birthday, Ops. I'm honored to be the Secretary of State in office for this milestone. When President Kennedy asked Secretary Rusk to create a 24 seven watch center to monitor global events, he perhaps couldn't have envisioned just how essential the Operations Center would become to the work of the State Department and the entire national security apparatus of the U.S. government. But he knew that a team of hyper-competent, diligent, and unflappable civil and foreign service officers would make us more vigilant, more connected, and more ready to respond and lead world events. And boy, was he right. The Operations Center facilitates more than a quarter million phone calls every year, including thousands of calls for me. And no matter where I am, whether it's in the air or on a bumpy road in a remote part of the planet, ops always comes through. You issue hundreds of alerts and hundreds of thousands of news items. You facilitate access to sensitive intelligence. You assist U.S. citizens during crises, stay in close contact with post overseas, and brief my team and me on urgent national security developments in real time. And during emergencies, from the 1979 storming of the embassy in Tehran to 9-11, to the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. It's ops that coordinates the department's response, keeping all of us up to date with critical information we need to make the right calls. And soon, you'll be doing all that work from a new state-of-the-art suite. You're also committed to diversity, equity, inclusion. And that's important, because ops is a training ground for future leaders at state. It's gratifying to see such a diverse range of Impressive officers come through ops, many of whom later take key roles on the sixth and seventh floors. I've now served a few times at the State Department as a special assistant in EUR, as deputy secretary, and now secretary. I can't imagine the State Department without the Operations Center. We couldn't do our jobs without you. The cool under pressure communicators, problem solvers, detectives, and team players of ops. Congratulations on 60 years. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for taking the time to recognize this important milestone. It is the honor of every ops officer to support you, as they have done for each of your predecessors dating back to 1961. Now I would like to welcome to the screen, Mr. Navarro Moore, who will be our host for the rest of the evening. Navarro currently serves as the Operations Center Watch Coordinator. Prior to this role, Navarro served as a senior watch officer in ops, senior Kenya desk officer, acting deputy director in the Office of East African Affairs and chief of staff for the Bureau of African Affairs. He has also done several overseas assignments, including tours in Ghana, Australia and El Salvador. Welcome Navarro. Thanks, Jane. I know you have a fascinating panel lined up for us. But before you get started, I wanted you to help me share with our viewers a little bit of Operation Center history. Well, in 1961, during the Bay of Pigs incident, 
President John F. Kennedy directed the State Department to establish an office to facilitate time-sensitive communications during diplomatic crises. It was to be staffed 24 hours a day with direct links to the White House, the Pentagon, CIA, and other key institutions. Secretary of State Dean Rusk initiated the Operations Center on April 30th, 1961. And through the years, OPS has been at the center of some of the most significant moments in American diplomatic and world history. When you call a list of crises that rocked the world, OPS was there to help coordinate information and connect key decision makers. Tehran, Saigon, Nairobi, Jonestown, Lockerbie, Fukushima, and the terrible events of 9-11, OPS was there to assist. Often, they were the first to get word of the crisis and to brief U.S. government officials on events as they unfolded. Over the years, the Operations Center came to specialize in crisis coordination. And in 1976, OPS stood up its Office of Crisis Management and Strategy, or CMS. CMS began modestly with three officers and has grown over the years to take on new responsibilities in response to crises like Benghazi. Today, CMS stands up round-the-clock task forces to manage long-term crises. For example, from 1982 to 2010, there were 442 task forces and monitoring groups run by CMS in response to natural, natural disasters, terrorism, and civil unrest around the world. Since then, there have been hundreds more, including last year's COVID-19 repatriation task force that brought over 100,000 Americans home from overseas. The technology and tools used to communicate in ops have evolved over time. There was the NASA phone used in the 1980s to monitor movements of the space shuttle. And who could forget the famous pneumatic tubes we used to deliver documents quickly throughout the State Department. I actually used those. We plan to display these and other ops artifacts in our future museum. But even as technology changed, what remained constant was the skill and dedication of the people of ops. On the job, they refined important diplomatic skills such as composure, situational awareness, teamwork, and concise communication. These skills are essential in a crisis and have propelled many OPS alumni into the highest ranks of the department. OPS has definitely been a training ground for leaders in diplomacy, as you will see tonight. So now that we've gone down memory lane, I'll now turn the program over to you, Navarro. Awesome, thank you so much, Jane. It is a, it's an exciting time indeed. Well, now that we know a little bit about why we're here, um, I'd like to take the next moment to introduce our panelists for today. Holly Adamson is a crisis management officer with the Operations Center's Office of Crisis Management and Strategy. She joined the Foreign Service in 2009 and switched to civil service in 2019. She served in Conakry, Tel Aviv, Bangui, on the line, and with the Deputy Secretary for Management and Resources. Next, Nicholas Klinger. Nick is currently a desk officer for the Czech Republic and Slovak Republic in the Office of Central European Affairs. He previously served as a watch officer and senior watch officer in the Operations Center. He's also served in Tegucigalpa and Ciudad Juarez. And finally, Emily Yu. Emily is a current watch officer in the Operations Center. She joined the Foreign Service in 2014 and her previous assignments included Seoul and Guatemala City. She's a proud Pickering Fellow. I'm just going to take a little bit of time just to talk about our format for our session today. Our format will revolve around three themes. First, a basic intro to ops. Second, behind the scenes in ops. And finally, how working in ops prepares officers for the rest of their diplomatic careers. For each theme, we'll start the discussion with a couple of short videos, and then we'll turn it over to general discussion for the group. And maybe with that, we'll go to our first video. 
So the operations center is responsible for, as we say, getting the right information to the right people at the right time. And so that involves really mining through not just open source uh, material, but also intelligence in order to determine what needs to go to our various principals and audiences within the department um, and ensuring that everyone has what they need to be most effective in their positions. One thing that struck me um, is the the U.S. governments, the, the, the entire government's reliance on the operations center uh, to maintain connectivity uh, between different elements of our government, whether it's defense, the intelligence community, the analytical community, um, the economic affairs actors like Commerce, Treasury, TSA. The Operations Center is seen as a reliable, um, useful, uh, and, and collaborative resource uh, that uh, provides accurate information, timely information, um, and value added to the discussions uh, on breaking developments in the world at large. So with that, maybe Emily, if you would like to start us off, um, how would you describe the functions of ops in three words? Feel free to provide any brief details about each word that you've chosen. Thank you for the question, Navarro. And of course, it's an honor to be here speaking with uh, my two other panelists, Nick and Holly. If I were to describe the functions of ops in three words, I would say inform, alert, and connect. We're constantly watching open media sources and we're watching this 24 seven. So any issues that we see progressing, we can inform our principals on the seventh floor. And I remember being on the floor when we got uh, alerts of attacks on our embassy in Baghdad. In that situation, we had to alert our principals, even going up to the executive secretary. And through her, she informed our secretary. And the last word I mentioned is connect. And to me, that's one of the most meaningful words because we are also the lifeline for many of the American citizens throughout the world who need to connect with their loved ones. And so when we get a call from an American citizen who's reaching out about their family member who may be overseas, it is the function of Operations Center to connect them with an embassy overseas to hopefully assist them with whatever they need to do. And to me, that's that's one of the most important aspects of our job. Nick, maybe I'll turn to you next. Um, could you tell me a little bit about what is the golden thread and how do we weave it for the department? Great, Navarro, thanks for having me. Holly, Emily, pleasure to be with you. The golden thread, I knew nothing of the golden thread before I got to ops, but in essence, it describes the central way in which the operations center understands what matters, what doesn't matter, equally important, who knows what and who needs to know more. And so just like the principles that we serve, ops is inundated with an incessant flow of information from all sources. But one thing the operations center does really well is it separates the relevant, timely, accurate, important information from all of the noise that's out there. And then ops determines who needs to know what, when, and how that information is best conveyed to the principles that we serve, whether it's through a direct phone call, through a written brief product, through an alert to the entire department. One thing ops tries to avoid is surprises at all costs. So we make sure that all of that insight and information that matters most is woven together and provided to our department principals in, in the best way best way for, forward. Yeah, it, it's definitely something that we do every day via all sorts of, of, of means and, and that's 24 seven. Um, so it's a thread that's never completely woven, right? Yes, sir. Be perfect. Emily, uh, back to you. Uh, could you describe a typical day in the life of a watch officer or of a crisis management officer? I think one of the really exciting aspects of working in ops is that no two days are exactly the same. But um, what I can offer is that uh, currently we are working on a 12 hour shift. So I would arrive to work about an hour earlier, do what we call read in to uh, brief ourselves on what are the issues that we are tracking? What are the important issues that the seven floor principals are tracking? And after that, 
we are watching the world, connecting calls if we have scheduled calls. And on very exciting days where we just don't know what is happening, it could be a barrage of calls. But we also have our daily products that we work on, written products, as Nick has mentioned, where we produce um, what we're watching around the world to the seven floor principles. But I think, again, back to the original point, that's what's so exciting about ops. You just never know what kind of shift or what kind of way we're walking into. Yeah, that, that's so true. Uh, Nick, I might actually ask you to kind of zoom out for us now um, and tell us a little bit about how ops fits into the greater State Department function and, and strategy of the department. Yeah, absolutely. I think Emily's touched on this just a little bit with her previous comments. It, it sounds cliche, but the world never sleeps, but all of us do. Um, the operations center never sleeps. The lights are always on. And so anyone in the department, anywhere around the world is always a telephone call away from reaching a watch stander who is ready to connect them to anyone else in the world and provide them with insight and information on what's happening. And it's really one of the most incredible tools that department leadership and senior officials throughout the US government have at their disposal. I think first and foremost, at its core, the operations center facilitates telephone diplomacy for the secretary, deputy secretary, and other senior leaders. So the operations center, the watch standards, make sure that there's flawless connection between the secretary, his or her foreign counterparts, as well as with the president here in Washington and other senior leaders across government. But I think something that Emily touched on earlier, you know, aside from the high level calls that ops facilitates and the briefs and alerts, uh, providing security to American people is a role that ops regularly plays. Outside of the core working hours, the operation of, of folks here in Washington, the Operations Center fields calls from U.S. citizens all over the world. Could be someone here domestically who's in need of information on an emergency passport renewal. Could be someone somewhere else in the world who's had an emergency and is in need of connecting to an embassy's consular section. So for lack of a better way of explaining it, we're an American citizen services section uh, for a large portion of the time in which we're on the ops floor. So we may be briefing the executive secretary on a, an important foreign policy matter in one call, and then moments later be providing some level of comfort and hopefully satisfaction to a US citizen that's in need of assistance. I think both are equally important to the mission of the Department of State, and it's an important role that the operations center plays. Sure. Thanks so much for that, Nick. Um, we all know that, that ops is, is built for crises. Um, that's why we're here, and, and, and that's at our, at our core. Um, Holly, how does ops actually respond in a crisis, and how does it prepare for a crisis? Um, I would say, you know, when it comes to responding for a crisis, uh, one of the greatest analogies that I can use between both the watch and the CMS side is the watch is sort of like the, um, the 911 dispatchers and CMS is then the EMT crew that comes out. And so we really are sort of the first responders when it comes to the information flow that comes out of a crisis. Um, you know, I, I distinctly remember a number of crises that happened, um, you know, while I was in the office where, you know, post was calling into the watch and, and now we're on our side connecting the relevant individuals within the department who then need to take action to, to help that particular post with the crisis that they're encountering. Um, and of course, you know, when it comes to prep preparation for a crisis, um, knowledge is our number one friend. And, and what I mean by knowledge is, you know, knowledge of what we've done in the past, of our lessons learned. Um, because surely this is not the first hurricane, this is not the first earthquake, and it's not the first terrorist attack that's happened um, at our various locations overseas. And so using those lessons that we've learned from our previous crises really help um, both watch and the CMS team uh, work with our posts overseas and our colleagues in the interagency and within the building to, to be as prepared as possible for the next instance. Sure, and, and just to pick up on that point, uh, that's actually a really great point. It's also forward looking, right? So as you mentioned, kind of using those, gleaning those past lessons learned and being able to, to apply those lessons uh, to future crises. 
Um, you also touched on another point that I would like for Nick to expand on um, a bit about OPSIS relationship with um, the department's regional and functional bureaus. Um, Nick, could you explain a bit of that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the department's greatest assets are its people and within the regional and functional bureaus in the department are, are the true experts covering just about everything. So while the operations centers are monitoring late breaking news, we may not always have the context or the insight to again, know really what matters um, and who may need to know further information. And so ops leans very heavily on the regional and thematic experts across the department to provide us with insight and clarity so that we know what matters and what doesn't. And so one role that the operations center will play is we will regularly call on desk officers, office directors, DASs, other individuals within the department to flag breaking news stories and to seek context to better assess, number one, the accuracy of that information, but also whether the information is important and whether they have any additional context to provide, specifically whether the information, in their opinion, rises to the level of the seventh floor. I know the bureaus, in turn, also depend on the operations center. The building trusts the watch to get the right information to the right people at the right time. Specifically through our products, especially the alerts on breaking news of impact to department personnel or facilities. This may be the first time in which department leaders um, at all levels become aware of, of new information. And so it's always interesting, it's a little bit gratifying when you see a flurry of calls and activity from senior department leadership based on a story or an alert that the operations center pushed out. That's great, Nick. And that's also a great segue uh, to the next part of our program here, where we're gonna delve into a bit of being inside ops or, or an, an inside look um, into the operations center. So crisis management and strategy evolved over time in response to crises that were happening overseas. For example, the bombings of our embassies in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi necessitated a different way for the department to start responding to crises. And so our office grew after those bombings. And then in response to 9-11, that caused our office to take on a bigger mission. And then in my time, uh, the attack on our post in Benghazi had a big impact on the mission of what our office does and really expanded uh, all of our efforts into more strategic, proactive risk management. That day was actually the day of the devastating 2004 uh, tsunami in Asia that killed, I think, about 230,000 individuals. And when we sat down for that shift, maybe an hour into the day, we started to get the first reports that there had been an earthquake and maybe a small oceanic event. And as the course of that day went on, we alerted Secretary Powell hourly over the day as the death toll grew from you know a few hundred to a few thousand. I think when we got up from the chair after eight or nine hours that day, there were already over 100,000 confirmed fatalities. So we're talking now a bit about some of these memorable moments uh, from um, the time from time on the op floor and specifically kind of going behind the scenes of, of what those moments actually entail. Um, Emily, to help us kind of build this picture, could you tell us a bit about who works in ops and kind of describe the team for us? Absolutely. I think one of the greatest assets of, of ops and something that ops management in the front office has, has done a really great job is, is building a very diverse team. And when I mean a diverse team, I mean we have folks joining us from the civil service. We have folks from different cones, from with different regional expertise. All of us um, together put it in a team. There are about 30 or so watch officers and um, about 11 senior watch officers. And our main teams are composed of five watch officers plus a senior watch officer. And I think to me, it's been a truly unique experience having the opportunity to work with our civil service folks who have developed so much expertise in either it, whether it's a regional bureau or a functional bureau and having their knowledge inform how we watch events around the world. And we as a team will work together watching the news and discussing with one another. Um, for instance, if I have an expert on my team in EAP or EUR, I will lean on that person to ask for their background. 
And of course, we rely on our senior watch officers to, to get uh, his or her judgment. And beyond that, we have our front office, we have a watch coordinator um, that you currently have are in the position of. We have the deputy director and our director. But um, again, to me, I think what's really unique about how ops functions is, is just the teamwork and the, our focus on, on um, recruiting such a diverse group of people so that we are much more informed as an office. And again, teamwork is, is I think the bedrock of how we function, how we perform well. So that's a little bit of, of the team in ops. Great, thank you. I always like to tell people that uh, teamwork hits different in ops. Um, and so maybe Holly, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to kind of talk a bit about how the watch and CMS work together um, in a crisis. And maybe if you could also tell us um, a bit about uh, a recent crisis that, that you've worked on as well. Sure. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind um, is the 2019 Easter bombings in Sri Lanka. Um, back in 2019, we were still in our old um, operations center office space where we were connected by a panel of sliding glass. And as the watch started to get those uh, news notifications in that, you know, explosions were happening in Sri Lanka, um, you know, there was a lot of activity between CMS and, um, and the watch. And we could tell from the other side of the glass that something big was happening. So we immediately opened that, that sliding glass door and were folded into um, the chaos as it was happening. Um, I know that one watch officer had host on the line, another watch officer had um, folks from the interagency as well as um, the DS command center on the line. We were able to connect all of those parties together onto one phone line. And it happened, um, the, the first sort of explosion started to happen right as I was in the middle of drafting our morning product that was going out um, 10 minutes from, from when that first phone call happened. So we were actually able to get information into that product while it was happening and sent that product out at 7 a.m. And, and that was probably the first notification that many of our, our department leaders had even heard of what was happening in Sri Lanka. So that was really a perfect example of how CMS and the watch truly worked together seamlessly to actually get the right information to the right people at the right time. And maybe even before you know the right time because it was, it was so quick and, and all happened simultaneously. No, that's great. That's, that's an excellent uh, example, Holly. Thank you for that. Um, looking at how ops kind of uh, continues to operate seamlessly, um, even throughout administrations, um, that's something that we pride ourselves on is providing a high level of, of service um, throughout various uh, time points in, in US history and in the government even overall. Um, Nick, can you talk about how our functions and our processes have changed from administration to administration um, to fit with our, our principles outlooks, but at the same time allowing our level of customer service to, to maintain uh, to maintain the kind of high standard that we're known for? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's there's the famous picture of, of the first operations center. It wasn't really much of a center, it was a room with one man and a cot and a pitcher of water. And he had a telephone on a desk. Um, and in large part, the function that, that that individual was attempting to facilitate for senior US government officials, um, all kidding aside, it's kind of sort of what we're doing now. We're there 24 seven, 365 days a year. And we, pr we provide that level of comfort and security to US government officials worldwide to know that they truly are a phone call away from being able to connect to a watch officer and then being able to connect to another senior leader in government. That core function remains the same. And that really is the bedrock of what the operations center is there to do. I think though, of course, we serve at the pleasure of the secretary. And so the core functions can bend uh, to the preference of the individuals that we're serving. I know that some secretaries and executive secretaries have been known to lean very heavily on the operations center for briefs over the phone during the course of the day, really at any time on any particular topic. 
If the secretary or a senior leader calls and wants information, he or she is guaranteed to reach on the line one of five watch officers or a senior watch officer. That's a guarantee and a function that has never changed. I think also one thing that hasn't changed, but that I think is being more amplified in importance is the ability for the operations center to cull through the just sheer volume of information from a variety of sources that our principals are receiving on a daily basis. One of our previous deputy secretaries of state said that when he rolled out of bed and looked at his, his Blackberry, his iPhone, and saw a hundred different messages that awaited him in the morning, the first message that he always went to was the 016 brief from the senior watch officer. He knew with certainty that there'd been a team at the department that had stayed up all night culling through all of that information and had already determined the most important information that the Deputy Secretary of State, the Secretary of State and other senior leaders in the government needed to know. And so that's a fundamental value that the Operations Center has added for decades on end and I think will continue to add. But to your original point, Navarro, we serve at the pleasure of the Secretary and we will continue to improve our processes and seek to, um, seek to get the right information to the right time, at the right time to the right people in whichever manner they'd like to receive. Excellent, no, that's great. Um, Nick, I'm gonna actually follow up with you. Um, can you describe a bit about how ops works with the interagency uh, with other operation centers? Yeah, absolutely. So we have counterparts throughout government, whether the Department of Homeland Security, F FAA, FEMA, DOD, the White House Situation Room, Diplomatic security also has its own operations center across the river that state ops communicates with on a very, very regular basis. And so we exchange information with these other operations centers um, via regularly scheduled conference calls across the interagency so that everybody has a regular touch point to talk about things that they're seeing or tracking or would like to receive more information on. Then of course, a lot of the written products, the alerts and briefs that the operations center publishes our target audience may be in the department, but those get pushed out across the interagency as well. I think one really important value, while we are a lifeline to folks in the department, the other interagency counterparts see us as a lifeline and us to them as well. So that at any point of day, if there's ever a need to touch base with someone else at another government agency, that we have that number at the ready to pick up and call the phone. I think one thing to emphasize the Department of State, of course, has the most expansive global presence. So any government agency from the senior levels of the White House on down, look to the department as the eyes and ears on the ground around the world. And we, of course, have at our disposal, not just the regional and functional bureaus in Washington, but our network of consulates and embassies around the world that we can reach out to uh, with the click of a button to try and get more insight and information. And so whether it be the White House Situation Room or other interagency partners, they really do look to us to be those eyes and ears on the ground and to provide them with those real-time updates on things that their principals, their leaders are most focused on. Perfect, thanks so much, Nick. One, uh, one theme uh, that I'm sure um, the audience has come across here consistently is that uh, the lifeblood of ops um, are our people. And so the next segment here, we're actually gonna talk a bit about how ops prepares um, its officers for uh, their future diplomatic careers. It taught me to think on my feet. It taught me that there's nothing more important uh, than accomplishing the mission and being part of a team uh, that works effectively together. Um, since being uh, in the operations center, I was special assistant to Secretary Clinton. I was director for Iraq at the NSC, Consul General in Basra, I'm currently the executive assistant to the secretary. Um, all of those things began in the operations center. Well, professional development in the ops center is very important for a couple reasons. One is uh, we really do consider people that work in ops to be the future leaders of the department. And so we take that very seriously as managers uh, that we want to prepare them uh, for the jobs that lie ahead for them. So we have a very robust professional development program and one that I haven't seen, quite frankly, replicated in other organizations that I've worked in in the department, but I think is a best practice. So Emily, turning to um, 
how ops prepares um, its officers. Um, what kinds of professional development experiences have you seen or been a part of in the operations zone? Thank you for that question. I remember entering the Foreign Service in 2014 and initially during a 100 orientation, we had gone on a tour of the Ops Center. And since then there is lore of what the Ops Center is and how it really is um, the place you want to be. And it really has been that for me for the past several months. And when I say that is because there is intention in the team to help folks watch office senior watch officers what have you really work on professional development and one example of that is briefing being uh, someone who can brief on the spot either a piece of information on the phone or having a very concise written product and that's something that from day one when you enter the ops center as a trainee you work on you will get that call in the morning after 11 to 12 hours on the shift from say director Klein or the executive assistant and they will call in for a brief and you have to be able to deliver a brief very succinctly. But I think that is a key skill for any foreign service officer to have. And that's something that I've been, I think able to hone and that's what others in ops are really working on too. And I think in addition to that, other opportunities are um, even speaking to the highest level of department principals on a day-to-day -day basis or offering tours um, to say the deputy secretary who um, visits ops. I think there are opportunities to speak with such um, principles that you may not have as a junior officer like myself. And I think lastly, I would say is really getting a bird's eye view of how the department works. Um, we're working to support the secretary's extensive telephone diplomacy, but we're also watching you develop and watching how bureaus or um, different department directors handle news. And we're also watching the desk officers uh, brief the secretary in certain events. So I think having that bird's eye view, working on our briefing skills and having the opportunity to speak to such high level principles is just an unparalleled opportunity for, um, for me and um, it's been a wonderful experience. Excellent, thanks so much. Um, Nick, with such a unique mission and, and some, some really tough work here that the panel has described, uh, what do you think attracts people to ops? Uh, what sorts of qualities do they have to have in order to be successful? Yeah, sure. I, I think Emily touched on a lot of those. You know, first and foremost, what an amazing opportunity to directly serve the Secretary of State, the Deputy Secretary, and, and senior officials throughout the department. That, that was, for me, one of the biggest honors was knowing that the work that we did on a daily basis truly mattered. And it wasn't, it wasn't a, do we think it matters? We knew right away that what we were doing was important um, and that we were playing a vital role in the success and implementation of, of U.S. foreign policy at the highest levels. Um, but aside from that, I've never worked in a more fun, fast-paced, collaborative environment than the operations center. I'm a little anxious that I will never have a more job, a, a job for the rest of my career that provided me with so many incredible memories. And Navarro, I see you smiling a bit. We shared some of those memories on the floor. Um, we had a great time. The camaraderie in the operations center is truly unlike any other place in a professional setting that I've experienced. Um, Emily mentioned taking a tour with our A100 class. Um, we often reflect and think back about those cohorts of people that we've moved with uh, during our time in the department, be it our A100 colleagues or our, our friends from our first or second tours overseas, but the, the friends and colleagues that I forged really strong relationships with in the operations center over my year will be people that I will continue to um, build friendships with and, and will continue to, to support and look for support during the course of, of my career in the department. So an amazing opportunity at a mid-level 
to, to serve at the highest levels in the department on the seventh floor directly for the secretary. It's also an amazing place to polish your skill sets that are paramount to being a successful diplomat. Like Emily mentioned, the ability to give a really crisp oral brief, again, the ability to know what matters and what doesn't, and the ability to be a really strong team player in an open collaborative environment. No, excellent. Thank you so much, Nick. I, I, I really appreciate that. And yeah, I, I, I was smiling a bit. Um, you know, I still do love cherry pop tarts, even after eating so many at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, Emily, um, over to you. What do you think is Ops's greatest asset? I think we've we've touched on that um, during several responses, but I have to go back again to to A100 when I initially had that tour and the idea just stuck with me thinking that I want to serve in ops. And so throughout my career in my first tour and my second tour, I reached out to my mentors, my ambassadors and DCMs at Post, um, actually both of whom are ops alums. And, and they told me that, Emily, what the most attractive thing about ops is turns out to be the people. And I, and I really didn't, Actually believe them, but uh, having served ops this time, it truly is the people that you remember, the folks that are there for you um, to help you on the floor during the crisis. Um, I think, as we mentioned previously, each of the everyone has to work as a team, and several times we always have to lean in to support each other. But really, what surprised me, and what is most memorable to me to me this year is on top of international crises and also lots of domestic events that we're going through, going through working during the pandemic, I've been so pleasantly surprised by my colleagues who are just genuine and kind people who've taken the time outside of work to check in on each other, whether that's emails or text messages. And I know several of us have gone through personal tragedies and it's amazing how the team has truly stepped in and helped each other during this time. And I still have a couple months left of my time in ops, but I can already say that while the work is so meaningful, I will take with me the friendships and the people that I've met during my time in ops. And, and I will be forever grateful for that. Excellent, thank you so much. Emily, um, if you don't mind, I'll actually stay with you. Um, and I'd like to kind of drill down a bit on uh, the elements of your professional identity that you feel that have grown and matured since you've been in ops. Thank you for that question. Um, I've, I've done some thinking at least recently and I think that ops has again focused so much on professional development that I've been more comfortable in my voice, have gained the tools that I've needed to fight this imposter syndrome that unfortunately I enter the department with. But I think it really speaks again to ops leadership and also to the really great people that we were able to recruit this year. It's about the team and supporting each other. When one team member lags behind, I think all of us step in and encourage and motivate. And I think that's a positive support. And I recall during an especially busy shift, there were rockets being um, fired at our embassy and there were other people on the floor and it was a very frenetic shift. And I got a call from one of our deputy executive secretaries and I, and I didn't offer the best briefing and I got, that. I got really nervous about my briefing skills. But um, as a result of that, a lot of folks came in and helped me practice my briefing to work on it. And senior watch officers took the time to give me feedback to give me suggestions on how I can work on my briefing. And I think since then I've really leaned into being more confident in my voice and being more confident in my skills as a diplomat. Thank you for that, Emily. Uh, Nick, turning back to you for our, our, our last question of this segment. Um, Nick, you've been, you've been gone now. You've, uh, you left the operations center now about, about a year ago uh, after, after 
us calling you back to help us out with uh, our response to COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but Nick, can you tell me a little bit about what teamwork looks like after ops? Um, so, you know, using your experience now of, of transitioning to, um, to another job in the, in the department, how have you kind of maintained those links with, within your team and continue to use your ops network um, in your new position? Yeah, absolutely. So going, going back just a bit to what Emily was saying about teamwork in the operations center, you know, one of the big values of ops is really the transparent in, interdependent environment that you're working with. You're all on the floor together in direct contact in, in, in shouting distance to one another. And so there's an interdependency in that work environment that's really difficult to try and replicate elsewhere. And I think it's been even more so compounded by the social distancing nature that we find ourselves in during this pandemic, where others outside of ops may go days or weeks at a time without coming face to face with their peers or uh, their supervisors. In the operations center, you spend eight hours or even 12 hours now with these lengthier shifts, staring eye to eye with the senior watch officer and with your watch officer colleagues. And so that's been something very difficult. I know that, um, that others outside of ops have had a challenge with is how do you continue to foster um, the type of teamwork and collaboration and open communication that we prided ourselves on in the operations center that's just really so difficult to replicate elsewhere. One of the things that I think is uh, of true value to the operations center that Emily touched on is the ability to get almost instantaneous feedback from your peers. And that, again, is something that's difficult to replicate elsewhere, but is something that I have tried to seek out from others uh, in the current office in which I work and something that I'll certainly try and seek out elsewhere is how can I be better? Tell me how I can be better and how I can be a better team member to you and to the broader mission of the office and to the department as a whole. Um, and so that's something that I'll forever take with me. One other thing that really resonated with me that I'll, I'll carry for, for the duration of my career came from the deputy director, uh, Belinda Jackson Ferrier, when I was in the operations center, she would routinely say, make better mistakes tomorrow. And what I took from that was that she didn't expect for us to be perfect. We, we, we never would be. We tried, but we never were. And she knew we would make mistakes but she wanted us to embrace those mistakes, take ownership of those mistakes, learn from those mistakes. And she knew we'd make a different mistake tomorrow, but it would be a better one. It wouldn't be the same. And so that's another thing that I've tried to bring with me in my new role and something that I'll carry with me as well. I can strive for perfection. We all can. We will never reach that perfection, uh, but try and be better each and every day, try and be better each and every shift in the operations center floor, learn from those mistakes, Share your mistakes with others so that others on your team don't make those same mistakes as well. That was a big benefit of ops, was learning from the tips and tricks, the stumbles that our counterparts made so that we ourselves could grow uh, not only individually, but as a, as a unit on the ops floor. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, yeah, I, I remember that as well. And, and also took that phrase, to, that phrase to heart as well. So thank you for that. Um, Thank you to all the panelists today. I mean, this was a this was a very this was a great discussion. Um, a lot of excellent points here. Um, I can say that uh, 60 looks good on us. Um, the operations center's uh, future is is very bright, and it was excellent to to be here with you all today and to share this moment. And now I'll call Jane back to the screen for the closing part of our session. Excellent. Many thanks, Navarro. And thank you so much to our panelists. That was an excellent conversation. And I thank you very much for really bringing the work of the Operations Center to life for our viewers. You really illustrated the importance of the work that's done there. I feel safer knowing you are there watching the world on our behalf. I'd also like to thank all of the previous staff of the Operations Center over the last 60 years. I know many of you are watching and we thank you for your service and helping to shape this great institution. Well, Navarro, all I can say now is happy birthday to the Operations Center. I can't wait to see what the next 60 years will bring. 
As we wrap up, I'd like to thank everyone who helped to make this program a success. And I encourage you to follow the progress of the National Museum of American Diplomacy on our website and on our social media platforms. We are pleased to share this type of history with the world. So good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And as we say on the watch when our work is done, ops will drop. <laughs>